In today's video, we'll talk about three famous people who took a life. But before that, we want to bring you a word from our friends and sponsors of this video, Magellan TV. Magellan TV has thousands of documentaries to watch, including some documentaries about history's most notorious crimes and infamous criminals. The other day, I watched a fascinating documentary called Inside JFK's Assassination. It details what five witnesses were doing in the lead-up to the shooting of President John F. Kennedy. The documentary weaves together their stories to tell a rich narrative of one of the most famous crimes of the 20th century. Inside, the assassination of JFK is just one of thousands of ad-free documentaries that are available on Magellan TV. They also have a lot of great documentaries that are available in 4K and they are breathtaking to look at. Magellan TV is run by filmmakers, and they are constantly adding new material, so there is always something new to watch. Magellan TV can be watched anywhere, at any time, on your TV, laptop, or mobile device. It works with Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play, Apple TV, and iOS, and you can even cast from your phone to your TV. Magellan TV has a special offer for criminally listed viewers. Just go to try.magellantv.com slash criminally listed and you'll get a month for free. So please help support Criminally Listed and find something great to watch by checking out Magellan TV. Number 3. Claudine Loger Claudine Loger was born on January 29, 1942 in Paris, France. Her mother was a physician and her father owned a company that manufactured x-ray equipment. In her late teens, Langer moved to Las Vegas, Nevada to be a professional dancer. She got a job with La Folie's Berger dance troupe, which performed at the Tropicana Hotel. In 1960, when Langer was 19, she and her friend were driving along the Las Vegas Strip. As Langer drove, the car started to have problems. They were forced to get out and push the car. Then a car pulled up behind them. The passengers of the car were singer Andy Williams and his manager. Williams said he stopped partly because he wanted to be a good Samaritan, but he was also struck by how beautiful Langer was. Even though Langer didn't speak English and Williams didn't speak French, they went out for dinner that evening. They started dating and then they were married on December 15, 1961. In 1962, Williams recorded a cover of the song, Moon River. Moon River was initially performed by Audrey Hepburn for the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's. The song was a massive hit for Williams and it launched him into the world of superstardom. It would go on to be the defining hit of his career. In early 1963, Claudine Langer had her first television role. She had two guest spots on the ABC sitcom, McHale's Navy. This led to more guest spots on other shows like Hogan's Heroes and 12 O'Clock High. In September 1963, Langer gave birth to a daughter. This was followed by a son in April 1965. In 1963, Andy Williams began his run starring in his own variety show, the aptly titled The Andy Williams Show. Langer started making guest appearances on the show, beginning with the first season's New Year's Eve special in 1963. In 1966, while Williams was rehearsing for his show, Robert F. Kennedy came into the studio. At the time, Robert was a senator for the state of New York and he was doing an interview in a different studio. Robert told Williams that he and his wife, Ethel, were big fans of the show. After that initial meeting, Robert and Ethel became close friends with Williams and Langer. Also in 1966, Langer appeared in the season finale of the NBC television program, Run For Your Life. She performed a bilingual version of the bossa nova hit, 
Meditation by Antonio Carlos Jobim. The co-founder of A&M Records saw the show and he was impressed by Langer. He signed her to a record deal. Her first album, Claudine, was released a year later. It reached number 11 on the Billboard Top 200. Langer would go on to record five albums with A&M and they were all moderate hits. She also continued to act. Langer's most prominent role was starring opposite Peter Sellers in the comedy The Party, which was released in the spring of 1968. She also made regular appearances on her husband's show. She would also make appearances on other variety shows such as This Is Tom Jones and the Bobby Darren Amusement Company. Angers was also a guest on late night talk shows like The Merv Griffith Show and The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Williams and Langer were possibly going to meet up with Robert and Ethel Kennedy after midnight on June 5th, 1968. Robert was running to be the Democratic candidate for the 1968 presidential election. They were all going to possibly meet up after Robert gave a speech at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. However, just after midnight, as Robert was walking through the hotel's kitchen, he was shot by 24-year-old Sirhan Sirhan. After he was shot, Williams and Langer went to the hospital where they met with Robert's family. 42-year-old Robert F. Kennedy died the next day from his injuries. In August 1969, Langer gave birth to a son. They named him Robert in honor of their murdered friend. Williams and Langer's marriage did not last much longer. In November 1970, it became public that Williams and Langer had separated. However, they remained friends. Langer continued to act, record albums, and she made appearances on variety shows and talk shows. Sometime after the split, Langer met world champion American skier Vladimir Sabic, who went by the nickname Spider. Sabic's father started calling him Spider just after his birth because he had been born premature and he had thin arms and legs. Sabic was three years younger than Langer, and he lived in Aspen, Colorado. Although Sabic had been born and raised in California, he was beloved in Aspen, and he was considered a local hero. For a few years, Langer split her time between Aspen and Malibu. Then in 1975, five years after their split up, Williams and Langer officially divorced. Langer and her children moved in with Sabic in Aspen. By that time, Spider Sabic was nearing the end of his impressive career, which included finishing fifth at the Solemn Races at the 1968 Olympics. His career as a skier was coming to an end because of a series of injuries. There were rumors that even after Langer moved in with Sabic, he continued to see other women. It's not known if Langer knew about the other women, but it is doubtful she would have put up with it. Langer was described as a very intense person, and she was in constant need of Sabic's attention. Several people remembered an incident at a nightclub when Langer threw a bottle at Sabic. According to Langer, Sabic was not paying enough attention to her. In March 1976, Sabic ended his relationship with Langer and he asked her to move out. A couple of weeks later, on the morning of March 21, 1976, Sabic and Langer went out skiing on different trails. That afternoon, Sabic went to a friend's home for a small get-together. He drank several beers. After Langer finished skiing, she went to a bar and drank a few glasses of wine. She then went shopping. At 5 p.m. they were both at home 
as were Lager's three children. Savig was planning on attending a party that evening. At about 5.05 p.m., a call came in to the emergency line at the local hospital. About 20 minutes later, an ambulance arrived at their home. The paramedics went into the bathroom and they found Langer holding a dying Sabic in her arms. Sabic had been getting ready to shower when he was shot in the abdomen with a 22 caliber pistol. He was not bleeding much, but the bullet had done some severe internal damage. Langer volunteered to give him heart compressions and the paramedics allowed her. She rode in the ambulance and she continued to give heart compressions. But unfortunately, Vladimir Spider Sabic, who was 31, died on the way to the hospital. People in Aspen were distraught over Sabic's death. He had been a large part of their community for some time and they considered Langer an outsider. People were also really upset by how she acted at his funeral. She had walked from the back of the service to stand front and center and she even picked a flower off his casket. Two weeks after the shooting, Langer, who was 34, was charged with reckless manslaughter. Langer claimed that the shooting was an accident. She claimed that Savage had been showing her how the gun worked and that it accidentally went off. Three months after the shooting, Saturday Night Live did a skit where Langer hosted a skiing competition called the Claudine Langer Invitational. The skit had footage of professional skiers wiping out with the sound of gunshots playing over them to make it look like the skiers crashed because they had been shot. Andy Williams was supportive of his ex-wife and he threatened to sue Saturday Night Live. The next week, Saturday Night Live issued their first ever apology for making light of a real crime. Claudine Langer went to trial for reckless manslaughter in January 1977. It was one of America's first celebrity trials. She was looking at a sentence of 10 years in prison if she was found guilty. But the district attorney's case suffered two major blows. The first is that the police didn't get a search warrant before they confiscated Langer's diary. In the diary, Langer details the decline of her relationship with Sabic, which would have spoken to motive. Langer was also forced to give a blood and a urine sample without a warrant. It turned out that at the time of Sabic's shooting, Langer had cocaine in her system. But since the evidence was not properly collected, the jury did not get to hear about any of it. The trial lasted four days. Andy Williams was there every day to support his ex-wife and the mother of his children. He even testified on her behalf. Langer also testified. She claimed that the shooting was an accident and she loved Sabig. She said that she respected life too much to have killed him on purpose. The jury deliberated for three hours and 40 minutes. Langer was found not guilty of reckless manslaughter but she was found guilty of a lesser charge, criminally negligent homicide, which was a misdemeanor. The maximum sentence was two years in jail and a fine of $5,000. On January 31st, 1976, Langer had her sentencing hearing. She begged for mercy on behalf of her children for killing 31-year-old Spire Sabig Claudine Leger was fined $250 and she was sentenced to 30 days in the county jail. She was allowed to choose when she served the 30 days. The judge was expecting her to serve it in the summer when her kids weren't in school. But right after the trial, Langer moved to Mexico with her defense lawyer, Ron Austin. 
Austin had abandoned his family to be with Langer. Over the next several years, Langer eventually served her sentence, mostly on weekends. She and Austin got married in June 1985, and they settled in Aspen. After the trial, Claudine Langer stayed away from the public eye. It's believed she still lives in Aspen. At the time of this video, she is 79 years old. Number 2. Don King Donald King was born on August 20th, 1931 in Cleveland, Ohio. When King was 18, he went to university, supposedly with the goal of being a lawyer. To help pay for his tuition, he became a numbers runner. A numbers runner records and collects illegal bets. King was smart, and he had a head for numbers. It wasn't long before he moved off from being numbers runner to a numbers bank, which is basically the house. They are the person who pays out on the bets and keeps the money when the better loses. King was successful, and the dream of being a lawyer soon became a distant memory. On December 2nd, 1954, King, who was 23, went to one of his gambling houses in Cleveland. He caught three men trying to rob the house. A gunfight broke out, and King shot a man named Hillary Brown in the back, killing him. The death was ruled a justifiable homicide, and King was not charged with anything. After the shooting, King continued to grow his empire. Besides being a numbers banker, he owned several businesses. By the mid-1960s, he was making about $15,000 a day. On April 20th, 1966, 36-year-old Don King walked into a bar on Cleveland's Cedar Avenue. It had been 13 years since he shot Hillary Brown to death. King rarely went anywhere without his gun and that day was no different. When King got into the bar, he saw one of his former employees, a man named Sam Barrett. Barrett owed King $600. Barrett was described as a sickly man. He recently had surgery to get one of his kidneys removed. He also had tuberculosis in his left lung. Despite his poor health, Barrett abused drugs. King weighed over 100 pounds more than Barrett. King and Barrett started arguing, and then their fight spilled out onto Cedar Avenue. King knocked Barrett down, and while he held his gun, he kicked and stomped Barrett in the head. Barrett kept saying he would pay him the money, but he eventually lost consciousness. The being attracted a group of onlookers, but no one intervened, even when it was clear that Barrett couldn't defend himself. Two police officers happened to pull up to the bar during the beating. One of the officers got out of the car, pulled out a service revolver, and aimed it at King. He ordered King to put his gun down. King did as he was told, and then he gave Barrett another vicious kick to the head. Barrett was in a coma for five days, and then he passed away. At the police station after the beating, Don King said he acted in self-defense. He said that Barrett had taken the first swing at him. After Sam Barrett died, King was charged with second-degree murder. When King went to trial in July 1967, most of the witnesses did not show up to testify. The FBI investigated the case and they thought that King had paid over $30,000 to pay off witnesses. The only witness was the police officer who arrested King. The jury deliberated for four hours and they found King guilty of second degree murder. For the conviction, King was looking at a possible life sentence. Then, something odd happened. 
the judge, Hugh Corrigan, met with King and his lawyer in private. No one from the district attorney's office was at the meeting. The day after Don King was convicted of second-degree murder by a jury, Judge Corrigan reduced his conviction to manslaughter. Journalist Jack Newfield wrote a book about King and he discovered that the FBI believed that Judge Corrigan was corrupt. King ended up being sentenced to 1 to 20 years of prison. In 1979, King was released from prison. For stomping a man to death, he served about 3 years and 11 months. After King got out of prison, he was introduced to the most famous boxer in the world, Muhammad Ali, by a mutual friend. King convinced Ali to find a charity match for a Cleveland hospital. This was the start of King's career as a boxing promoter. In 1974, King set up a fight between Ali and George Foreman. He promised both fighters $5 million. The problem was that King didn't have $10 million and he was having issues finding backers. He then somehow got in contact with Mobutu Sese Seko, who was the dictator of Zaire, which is now known as the Democratic Republic of Congo. Sese Seko offered to put up the money, but the fight needed to happen in Zaire. King agreed and the fight was billed the rumble in the jungle. The event was considered controversial because Zaire was an impoverished country that did not have an extra $10 million to spend on a sporting event. The fight happened on October 30, 1974 in Kinshasa, Zaire. Muhammad Ali knocked out the previously undefeated George Foreman in the seventh round. It's estimated that a billion people from around the world watched it on pay-per-view. The country of Zaire ended up losing $5 million for hosting the fight. The famous match solidified King as one of the most prominent boxing promoters in the world. Throughout his career, King has been accused of ripping off business associates and fighters he promoted. Nevertheless, King was a dominant force in the world of heavyweight boxing for decades. He also became a cultural icon and more famous than many of the boxers he promoted. In 1983, King was granted a pardon for his manslaughter conviction by the governor of Ohio. Sam Barrett's widow was bitter about the pardon. She said she wished that the governor could have seen Barrett after the beating he took. While Don King's career has been marred with controversy, he never killed anyone else. In 2016, the city of Cleveland announced that they were going to rename a segment of a street to Don King Way. For some reason that was never made clear, they were going to rename a segment of Cedar Avenue. In the middle of that segment is the place where he kicked and stomped Sam Barrett to death. Many citizens were upset by the proposal and it was soon quashed. Don King is currently 88 years old and he apparently still does some boxing promoting but is nothing like the promoting he did in the 1980s and 90s. Number 1. Jack Unterweger Vienna, Austria is a peaceful city with a low crime rate. The city was shocked on May 20th, 1991, when the body of 25-year-old Sabine Moitzi was found in the Vienna woods. Moitzi had been reported missing a month earlier by her husband. She was last seen alive on April 18th, 1991 by a friend who dropped her off at an intersection in one of the rougher neighborhoods in Vienna. Moitzi worked as a bakery saleswoman during the day, and unbeknownst to many of her friends and family, including her husband, she did sex work at night. Moitzi had been strangled to death with her stockings, which were still wrapped around her neck when her body was found. 
Three days later, 24-year-old Karen Aragu's body was found in the Vienna woods. Aragu, who was a sex worker, was last seen alive about two weeks earlier, on May 7th. She was last seen a few blocks from where Moitzi had been working three weeks earlier. She had been strangled to death with her leotards, which were still tied around her neck. The detective investigating the murder soon learned that other sex workers had gone missing within the same month as Moisey and Aragu. 23-year-old Sylvia Zegler vanished on April 8, 1991. This was about eight days before Moisey was last seen alive. Zegler's remains wouldn't be found until months later, on August 4, 1991. Like the other two sets of remains, Zegler's remains were found in the Vienna woods. Regina Prem went missing on April 28th, about 12 days after Moitzi was presumably killed. Prem's remains were found over a year later. Because of the state of the remains, a cause of death could not be determined. The police were sure that one person was responsible for all four murders. All four women were sex workers who went missing within a month of each other. All their remains were found in the Vienna woods, and at least three of them had been strangled with a piece of their own clothing. The presumed serial murders attracted a lot of media attention. One journalist who was particularly interested in the case was a man named Jack Underweger. Jack was recording a story for Austria's National Public Service Broadcaster, the Austria Broadcasting Corporation, which is known by the acronym, the ORF. For the story, Jack interviewed Vienna's chief of police. Jack's radio segment aired on June 5, 1991. The chief of police listened to Jack's segment with his wife. The chief had never heard of Jack Unterweger before he met him, but his wife knew who he was because Jack was famous in Austria. Jack Unterweger was born in August 1950 in Austria. He claimed that his mother was a sex worker and his father was an American GI. Jack never knew his father. When Jack was a toddler, his mother was arrested for fraud and he was sent to live with his grandfather. Jack claimed that his grandfather was cold and distant from him, and they lived in poverty. He also said that at times, he was forced to sleep in the same bed as his grandfather. Jack said that at other times, his grandfather would bring home women, often sex workers, and he would have sex with them in the same room as him. Years later, Jack's aunt said that what he said about his childhood were lies. For example, Jack had his own bedroom. When Jack's aunt confronted him about his lies, Jack pretended he didn't know who she was. Jack lived with his grandfather for two years, and then he was put into a series of foster homes. Jack said that when he was a teenager, he went looking for his mother. He claims he didn't find her, but he did find his aunt, Anna, and he had a good relationship with her. He said that his aunt was a sex worker. In 1967, when Jack was 17, he said that his aunt was killed by one of her clients. Jack had his first brush with the law when he was 16. He was arrested for theft. Between October 1971 and January 1973, Jack was in prison for auto theft. It's believed that a few months after he was released, Jack committed his first murder. He was 22 years old at the time. On April 1, 1973, the body of a woman was found in a lake in Salzburg, Austria. She was nude from the waist down. Her wrists had been bound with a necktie, and her ankles were tied up with pantyhose. It appeared that the killer had punched her multiple times in the face. 
the medical examiner determined that she had been dragged or carried out into the lake while she was bound, and she drowned. The medical examiner thought she had only been dead for a few hours. The morning after the body was pulled from the lake, a man reported his wife missing. He identified the body as his wife, 25-year-old Marika Horvath. For two years, the case set cold. Then the lead detective learned that a 24-year-old man named Jack Unterweger had recently been arrested for sexually assaulting four women and murdering another woman. Jack caught the attention of the detective because of what he did to one of his victims who survived. He had attempted to sexually assault her near a body of water. He had bound her with her own clothes and punched her in the face several times. The young woman thought she only survived the attack because someone happened upon the assault and Jack was forced to stop. The murder that Jack was arrested for happened in December 1974. At the time, Jack was dating a young woman named Barbara Scholes. On the night of December 11, 1974, Jack and Scholes drove to Scholes' parents' home in Eversbach, which is a small town in Germany. They were planning on sneaking into Scholes' parents' home and stealing some money and items. But when they got there, they found the house locked and her parents were asleep. Jack decided they should rob another house. Then they saw 18-year-old Margaret Schaefer walking home. Growing up, Schaefer and Scholz had been neighbors and they had gone to school together. Schaefer had spent the night bowling with friends. Scholz invited Schaefer to come for a drive with them. She accepted and she got into the car. At some point, Jack stopped the car and assaulted Schaefer. He made her undress and then he bound her wrist with his belt. Then they drove out to a wooded area. Jack led Schaefer out into the woods while Scholl stayed in the car. He returned to the car about 15 minutes later with a metal rod that had blood on it. 18-year-old Margaret Schaefer was not with him. They drove for a while, and then they ditched Schaefer's clothes and the metal rod. About three weeks later, Margaret Schaefer's body was found in the woods. The medical examiner determined she had been beaten in the head with a blunt object and manually strangled. Then finally, she was strangled with her bra. The bra was still around her neck when she was found. About two months later, Jack and Scholz were arrested in Basel, Switzerland. They had a 16-year-old friend, and they were trying to scam her friend's parents by pretending she had been kidnapped and demanding a ransom. The girl's parents notified the police, and they set up a sting that led to the arrest of Scholz and Jack. When Jack was arrested, he was very familiar to the police because four women had accused him of sexually assaulting them. The police figured out that Barbara Scholz had lived on the same street as Margaret Schaefer. Since Jack had a history of assaulting women, the police decided to question Scholz about Schaefer's murder. She admitted that Jack had killed her. Jack was subsequently charged with Schaefer's murder. In Austrian law, one of their citizens can be tried for a murder that they may have committed in another country. So Jack Underweger was tried for the murder of Margaret Schaefer in Austria. At Jack's murder trial, he said that Schaefer reminded him of his mother and he suddenly became angry because he remembered how she abandoned him. He was convicted and he was sentenced to life in prison. He was sent to Stein Prison in Donau, Austria. The detective who was investigating the April 1973 murder of 25-year-old Marika Horvath wanted Jack to be charged with her murder as well. But the prosecutor chose not to charge Jack with the murder because Jack had already been given a life sentence 
but he could only be sentenced to life once. As a result, Horvath's murder remained officially unresolved. Before Jack went to prison, he was illiterate. In prison, Jack took correspondent classes on writing and literature. He then began writing children's stories. He submitted them to the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation. They ended up broadcasting about 50 of his stories. In 1982, a magazine published Jack's autobiography entitled Purgatory in serial form. The next year, Purgatory was published in book form. The book was a bestseller. In 1988, the book was adapted into a film which played in the theaters and aired on television. When it debuted at a film festival in Austria, Jack was allowed to leave prison to attend the opening. While Jack was in prison, he published six more books. Jack also wrote a play, and once again, he was allowed to leave the prison to attend the premiere. When Jack got to the theater, he was greeted by fans and paparazzi. The intellectual elites in Austria did not think that such a gifted person should be sitting behind bars. Starting in 1985, several influential people wrote letters to the Austrian government encouraging them to parole Jack. It appeared that the letters paid off. Jack Unterweger was paroled from prison on May 23, 1990. He had spent about 15 years and four months in prison. It was the minimal amount of time he could have served on a life sentence. When Jack got out of prison, he was a full-fledged celebrity in Austria. Over the next several months, he was on the cover of many of the national magazines and he also appeared on talk shows. He went on dates with prominent Austrian actresses and models. He went on tour with a play he wrote, directed, and starred in called Dungeon. In February 1991, he produced another play called Scream of Fear, which is about a man who contracts AIDS. Using a government grant, he went on a seven city tour. On June 11th, 1991, Jack traveled to Los Angeles, California. When he got there, he checked into the infamous Cecil Hotel. It's supposedly one of the last places Elizabeth Short, aka the Black Dahlia, visited before she was murdered in January 1947. It's also believed that serial killer Richard Ramirez had spent several weeks in the hotel. Decades later, 21-year-old Elisa Lamb mysteriously drowned in the water tank on the roof of the hotel. While Jack was in Los Angeles, he tried to track down several celebrities so he could interview them, but he didn't have any luck. One thing he managed to do was get a four-hour ride-along with an LAPD patrol car. He also wrote an article about prostitution in Los Angeles for an Austrian magazine. He tried to pitch his autobiography to people associated with the movie industry, but he did not have any success. When Jack returned to Vienna in mid-July, he was one of the leading suspects in the Vienna Woods murders. In the fall of 1991, the police departments in two other Austrian cities got in contact with the Vienna Police Department. They had experienced similar murders. The first one happened in Graz. Graz is the second most populous city in Austria and it's about 125 miles south of Vienna. The first woman went missing from there on October 26, 1990. This was a little over half a year before the first woman in Vienna was killed and six months after Jack was paroled. She was 39-year-old sex worker Brunhilde Masser. Her body was found in a wooded area two months after she went missing. She had been strangled to death with some type of fabric. Four months later, on the night of March 7, 1991, 
35 year old sex worker of Raider Strimp went missing. Her skeletal remains were found seven months later in a wooded area just outside the city. Most of her clothes were missing. Because of the state of the remains, the medical examiner could not say with any certainty what the cause of death was. However, the skeleton had no signs of trauma, so he thought she had been strangled to death. The other murder happened in the city of Bergenz on December 5th, 1990. This is in between the two murders in Graz. On that night, 31-year-old Heidi Marie Hammerer had been working her usual street corner. Her body was found about three weeks later in a marsh. It appeared she had been strangled to death with a pair of tights. In November 1991, 41-year-old Jack Unterweger started dating an 18-year-old woman. By Christmas, they were engaged to be married. Around the same time, the police in Vienna and Graz were desperate to arrest Jack, but they didn't have any physical evidence that would be considered the smoking gun. Jack was interviewed by detectives in both cities. He provided alibis for the nights of the murders, but none of them checked out. Some other sex workers had went to the police and told them that Jack had taken them to an isolated area and then was rough with them. The police thought that these actions matched the killer's M.O. The only difference was, for whatever reason, Jack didn't kill them. Jack denied ever meeting any of the sex workers, but all the sex workers had picked him out of a photo lineup. They were also able to identify him because he drove a car with a personalized license plate that contained his name. So the police believed the women's stories and they thought that Jack was lying. This solidified their belief that Jack really was the killer. In mid-February, Jack Unterweger went to a photo shoot. The photographer was friends with several police officers and he mentioned to Jack that the police were investigating him. Jack had assumed the police believed his alibis and they were no longer investigating him. When he learned that the police still considered him a suspect, he became spooked. On February 13, 1992, an arrest warrant was issued for Jack. But when officers went to arrest Jack, he was nowhere to be found. It turned out that he had took off with his 18-year-old fiance. But where they went was a mystery. While Jack was on the run, he called in to the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation and he proclaimed his innocence. Many people believed him and they thought he was a victim of a witch hunt. On February 26, 1992, less than two weeks after the arrest warrant was issued, the police in Vienna received a tip that Jack and his fiance were in Miami, Florida. The next day, Jack was arrested by U.S. Marshals. Jack decided not to fight extradition and he volunteered to return to Austria. This surprised a lot of people. Then, just over a week after Jack was arrested, the reason why he wasn't fighting extradition became clear. The United States Justice Department got in contact with the Los Angeles Police Department. They told them that between June 11th and July 16th, 1991, Jack Unterweger was in Los Angeles. The representative from the Justice Department suggested that they should look at their unsolved cases to see if they had any sex workers who had been strangled to death while Jack was in Los Angeles. They also said that the victim was most likely strangled with a piece of their own clothing. It turned out that the LAPD did have several murders that could have been committed by Jack Unterweger. On the morning of June 20th, 1991, the body of a dead, mostly nude woman was found in a vacant lot. She had been strangled with her own bra, which was still wrapped around her neck. 
The woman's fingerprints were entered into the system and a match was found. The body was 20-year-old Shannon Exley. Exley had been a sex worker who was addicted to crack cocaine and she had been arrested several times. Just over a week later, the body of another woman was found in an industrial area of Los Angeles. Like Exley, she had been strangled with her own bra. She was identified as 33-year-old Irene Rodriguez. Also like Exley, she was a sex worker. Days later, on July 10th, 26-year-old sex worker Peggy Jean Booth, who also went by the name Sherry Ann Long, was strangled to death. Her body was found in a canyon eight days later. She had been strangled with her bra, which remained tied around her neck. Then the murder suddenly stopped. Detectives in Vienna met with detectives with the LAPD. They compared the murders committed in their respective cities and concluded that one killer was responsible for all of them. So it's believed that Jack did not fight extradition because he did not want to be prosecuted in California. The first reason he didn't want to go to trial in California is that they had the death penalty. The second reason was that he wasn't a celebrity in California. But it turned out that the authorities in Los Angeles were not going to charge him because they did not have any physical evidence to connect him to the murders of the three women. On May 28, 1992, Jack Underbeger arrived back in Vienna. Around the same time, one of the Viennese investigators on the case was at a conference in Prague, Czech Republic. Prague is about 180 miles from Vienna. The investigator learned that the police in Prague were investigating a murder that was remarkably similar to the ones committed in Austria and Los Angeles. On September 15, 1990, 30-year-old Blanka Bakova was walking home in Prague. Her mostly nude body was found the next day in a wooded area just outside of Prague. The killer had strangled her with his hands in what appeared to be a piece of clothing. Unlike many of the other murdered women, Bakova was not a sex worker. It's suspected that the killer offered Bakova a ride home and instead took her to the woods where he killed her. The police found evidence that Jack was at Prague around the time of the murder. In May 1992, the investigators made a shocking discovery. Jack had always claimed that his aunt, Anna Unterweger, was a sex worker who was murdered in 1967. The investigators found out that a sex worker named Anna Unterweger was killed in 1967, but she was not Jack's aunt. Anna and Jack were not related, they just shared the same last name. It's believed that Jack just read about the murder in the newspaper. Also, there was no evidence that Jack's mother was a sex worker. The investigators suspected that Jack said his mother and aunt were sex workers who add to the mythology of his life. Jack Underbeger's trial started on April 20th, 1994 in Vienna. Since Jack could be tried for murders that he was suspected of committing in different countries, he was facing 11 counts of murder. This includes the murder that happened in September 1990 in Prague, the seven murders that happened in Austria between October 1990 and April 1991, and the three homicides that occurred in Los Angeles in June and July 1991. One murder he was not charged with was the 1974 murder of Marika Horvath. Jack's trial was billed as the trial of the century for several reasons. The first was that Jack was a celebrity. Also, the Austrian government had given him grants so he could produce plays and write books. While Jack was touring with his plays and being funded by the government, it is suspected that he killed three women. 
Jack had also been the poster boy for prison reform. The Austrian government was deeply embarrassed over the situation. And finally, Jack's trial was considered the trial of the century because serial killers are rare in Austria. No one in modern Austria had ever faced 11 charges of murder. The prosecution had a lot of evidence, but much of it was circumstantial. The main argument was that all 11 murders shared a lot of similarities. This suggested that one person committed all of them. The prosecution argued that if they could connect Jack to one of the murders, then the jury should logically be able to find him guilty of all 11 murders. So the prosecution spent a lot of time explaining the similarities between the murders. They noted that many of the victims were sex workers. The victims were driven out to the woods where they were sexually assaulted and strangled with their own clothing, usually a piece of undergarment. Many times the piece of clothing was tied around the victim's neck and it was left there. An expert testified that the knots were all tied the same. Jack's touring schedule, credit card statements, and receipts that were found in his possession were used to show that he was in the different cities around the times of the murders. There were also dated photos of him in the cities where the murders were committed. Also, Jack did not have alibis for any of the nights of the murders. Statistics were also introduced as evidence. In the years before Jack was released from prison, an average of 1.5 sex workers were murdered every year in Austria. After Jack was paroled, within seven months, seven sex workers were murdered. He also happened to be in Prague and Los Angeles when very similar murders were committed. The prosecution said that there was no way this could be a series of coincidences. The most damning piece of evidence was a strand of hair that was found in Jack's car. DNA testing was done and an expert said he was 99.99% sure that the hair belonged to Blanca Bakova. On the second last day of the trial, there was an explosion at the courthouse. Someone had detonated a bomb made with a high-grade military explosive. No one was hurt. The courtroom was on damage, so the trial continued. It's not known if the bombing was connected to the trial. The bomber has never been identified. Jack Underweger's trial lasted for 30 days. Then the jury deliberated for 9 hours. In Austria, the jury does not have to unanimously agree to reach a verdict. Instead, verdicts are decided by the majority. On nine of the eleven counts of murder, six voted to convict and two voted to acquit. The other four jurors were undecided. On the last two counts of murder, five people were undecided. There were the two cases where only skeletal remains were found. Because of the state of the remains, the medical examiner could not determine if there really had been a homicide, and this is why less jurors voted to convict. Jack was sentenced to life in prison on June 29, 1994. Hours later, 42-year-old Jack Unterweger was found hanging from a shower curtain rod in his cell. He had made a noose with a thin metal wire and the drawstrings from his sweatpants. Jack Underweger, the suspected killer of at least 13 women, was pronounced dead in his jail cell. Thank you so much for watching today's video. We hope you found it interesting. If you're looking for some new videos to watch, why not check out my new channel, Chapter Dark, and see if you can solve the mysteries in the videos. If you like riddles, puzzles, or escape rooms, Chapter Dark will be right up your alley. A link to Chapter Dark should appear on the screen momentarily you can also find a link in the description box below this video. If you enjoyed the video you just watched, we'd really appreciate it if you gave us a thumbs up. Please also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Roku 
The links are in the description box. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching, and please stay safe.